Thank you, thank you. I think um, I have a microphone on my ear, so I don't know if I need this one or not. But uh, first of all, it's just a delight to be here. I lived in Seattle twice. Um, my son was born here, and I left Seattle to go to um, Africa, uh, where my daughter was born, in Tanzania. So I say, no matter what, she really is an African-American. <laughs> um, and uh, I worked with uh, a number of you, including Larry Gossett. Uh, and so it was a time when he still had an afro, uh, <laughs> and I still had hair. Uh, uh, but it's been a delight being on this journey with many of you and with Larry. And the journey is hardly finished. Um, Dr. King left us something. He left us a vision, a way forward. And when he was here, obviously we didn't have iPhones, we didn't have the internet, but we did have racism. Um, and Malcolm X, who actually uh, was a co, um, in the same vineyard as Dr. King, the Reverend Dr. King, you said that racism is like a Cadillac. You get a new one every year. Uh, so it's not one thing. Uh, racism and the process of othering along racial lines is something that keeps changing and becomes more complicated. Please mention that we changed our name to the Othering and Belonging Institute. And we did that deliberately. I'm going to share a little bit of that history because I think it's relevant to our work and your work. And I do include our work as being related. Uh, we used to be the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society. And we decided about a year ago to change our name to the Othering and Belonging Institute. And that was a long journey. When I went to Berkeley to start the Institute, um, there were several different clusters. There was the cluster focused on race. There was a cluster focused on LGBTQ. There was a cluster focused on disability, religion, poverty, immigration, uh, and so on. And each one of them was doing incredibly important work. Uh, but they didn't really see their relationship with each other except as distant friends. And what I thought about is that all of them, all of them were grappling with the issue of who belongs. Uh, and they were all being met by structures and societies, by stories, by cultures, and by individuals, either hostily or indifferently saying, you don't belong. By people saying, essentially, you're invisible. Or if you're visible, you're only here assigned to a particular place. Um, there's a book out, some of you may know the book, called Strangers in Their Own Country. Uh, Strangers in, uh, and it's written by a colleague at Berkeley. And she writes about the dislocation of largely rural whites in America. And she talks about feeling strangers in their own country. And it's a, it's a real feeling, and I'll talk about that in, more in a minute. But when I read the title, I thought, how did this become their country? There were people already here. We just saw some of them uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, and we skip over that part of our history. Um, when I was teaching at the University of Minnesota, I was talking about the taking of land from Native Americans. And some of my white students, um, mainly liberal in Minnesota, objected. And they said, Professor Powell, we didn't sign up for a class on Native American history. And I said, this is not Native American history. This is American history. This is about us. <laughs> um, all of us. And so we have to own what we've done, own what we're doing, and collectively come together to move forward. So the reason we move from inclusion, and I gave a talk earlier this morning, that inclusion suggests you're joining something that's already there. So I give the example if I'm giving a party, and most of y'all look pretty cool, uh, so I'm inviting you to my party. 
but it's my party. You come as a guest. It's my music, my friends, my food. And at the end of the night, as they say, you don't have to go home, but you got to go. <laughs> uh, that's what inclusion suggests. It suggests that you're joining someone else's thing, whereas belonging suggests that you're co-creating the thing you belong to. You're co-creating. So now, instead of it being my party, it's our party. And we develop the food. We develop the playlist. We decide who's going to be invited or not invited. And that's good. But it's also work. Because when you show up at someone else's party, all you have to do is show up. When it's our party, we have to design it. And so we move from inclusion to belonging. And when we talk about belonging, we say there's four things you need. You need agency. You need power. You need love. And you need responsibility. You need all four of those things. And King reminds us that power without love is ruthless. And love without power is sentimental. And so we want to bring those two things together. So why do you need responsibility? A lot of times when you talk about people being marginalized, or, or especially when you talk about race, and especially when you talk about anti-black racism, people get defensive. It's like, well, I wasn't here, and I'm not responsible, and why are you talking about that? Are you blaming me? And responsibility is that we are responsible together for the party and the world we create. We are all responsible. Not, not one of us created climate change. But our actions, our institutions, our structures, our economy is contributing to the changing of the earth. It's contributing to a billion animals being killed in Australia. We are all responsible. And that comes with a need to collectively move forward. So belonging is inviting all of us. And I do, by all, I mean all. I don't mean just people of color. I don't mean just Americans. I mean all of us. And again, some people will take exception to that. Uh, and sometimes we'll even disagree. And that a disagreement could happen on different levels. Some of those disagreements we will think of as personal. I don't like so-and-so. So-and-so doesn't like me. And we talk about how do you actually deal with people who you think of as other. But we also remind people that there really is no other. King again reminded us that we're all connected. We're all connected. And the Reverend Dr. King did many things in his short lifetime. He died when he was 39. One of the most radical things he did was to nominate Thich Nhat Hanh for the Nobel Peace Prize. And a lot of people got upset. It's like, he ain't even black. <laughs> he doesn't even live in the United States. King was building a bridge. And he said, in order to fix the problems here in the United States, you have to actually connect to people all over the world. He was building a bridge. So one of the ways we actually build belonging is through building bridges. Now my friend Bell Hooks remind us, when you build a bridge, bridges are made to walk on. So when you connect to someone who looks a little different than you, who dress a little different than you, have a different name for God than you do, or maybe don't, they don't have a God at all, a lot of people will say, why are you connecting with those people? They're not even black. And the point of bridging is that we are already connected. And the challenge to bridging won't just come from, quote unquote, the other side. Sometimes it would come from your own group. They basically say, stay with your own group. Only care about your own group. So belonging is about saying everybody belongs. 
Everybody belongs. And so on. So when King was assassinated, he was reaching out across economic lines. Uh, and again, to co-create. What does co-create really mean? Now I know that there's some challenges here and there's challenges everywhere. Recently built a new facility for young people. And the question is, is that right or is that wrong? Should you do that or should you not do it? And those are serious questions to be put on the table. And I think it's important that you grapple with them. The answer, I don't know. I do know, I support the idea of zero detention for young people. I do know I care about black kids being locked up, Latino kids being knocked up, native kids being locked up, and even white kids being locked up. But I know that if you're black, the chance of you getting locked up goes up exponentially. If you're native, the chances of you being locked up and being exposed to suicide goes up exponentially. We have to care about that. We have to name those people, those communities who are left out. And we co-create. One of the things we have to make sure we do is the communities that are most impacted are at the table. Not the cage. Not the cage. At the table with the power and resources to actually fully co-create. And let me just be clear. They're not co-creating for themselves. They're co-creating for all of us. They get to co-create not just for the community, when I lived here, Larry, it used to be the Central District. I don't know where it is now. <laughs> but they get to co-create for the whole community, for the whole country, for the whole world. It's not your world. It's not my world. It's our world. <clears throat> and when I say our world, I don't mean we own the world. I mean we are part of the world. And the world is part of us. So how do we create a movement where we all get to show up? So I'm leaving here going to Europe because Europe's grappling with the same issues. And there's some people who believe that one group is better than another group, that one race is better than another race, that one religion is better than another religion. And we have to challenge that. Those of us who believe we are connected, those of us who believe that we show up deeply interconnected. The South Africans have a word, it's called Sabawanu. It's a Zulu word, and it means, I see you. And they go even further to interpret the God in me sees the God in you. And as we heard in our introduction, I am because you are. We are deeply connected. Some people don't believe that. But even those people, we have to hold on to their humanity. Doesn't mean we agree with them. It doesn't mean we like them. But we have to acknowledge they were all deeply connected to each other and to the earth. That's what belonging is about. It's a radical concept. But it's the only way I think we as people and we as a world continue to exist. As I said, going to Europe. Why Europe? Europe had a struggle. Within 60 years, they'd had three major wars. Bismarck from Germany, then World War I, then World War II. And they noticed something. Each war got more deadly. Each war killed more and more people. And the war was, what was it about? It's about a lot of things, it's about resources, but it's also about race. Many of you may, may not know that when Hitler was at the peak of his destructiveness, he said that there were four groups of white people in Europe, and only one were superior. So if you're an Italian, as far as Hitler was concerned, you weren't really white. You weren't fully human. 
And so his destructiveness almost destroyed all of Europe. And after the war settled, and we had been introduced to a new device called the atomic bomb, the Europeans said, and this is interesting because most of them didn't think of themselves as Europeans. And many of them didn't think of themselves as white. They were Germans, they were Italian, they were French, not European. But they said, if we do this again, we're in trouble. And Einstein said, I don't know what weapons we will use in World War III, but in World War IV, we will use sticks and stones because we'll be back in caves. He said, we can't do this anymore. So they created the European Union as a way of tying them together structurally, economically, politically. So it wasn't just an idea of saying, how do we show our interconnectedness, how do we belong? They, with, they did in terms of institutions, in terms of structures, in terms of schools, in terms of jobs. Not perfect, they're still struggling with it. But if King County is going to be a place for all, you have to think about it institutionally. You have to think about it in terms of your schools. You have to think about it in terms of your housing. You have to think about it in terms of your transportation. You have to think about it in terms of your police. It's not enough to have a slogan that we're all connected, or we still segregate people in places where there's no opportunity. You know, um, I'm very fortunate. I'm six of nine, which doesn't mean I'm a bork. Uh, it means there are nine children. I'm a middle child. I'm doing my mother's and father's work, but I was also doing the work of a middle child. My mom and dad were sharecroppers. Uh, and I sort of look at the projection of what's happened during their life. My grandfather was born in Mississippi. He used to always say, I'm glad to be from Mississippi. He died at 84 years old, deeply afraid of white people. When I went to college, I remember he said to me, as I was getting involved in a demonstration and helped start the Black Student Union at, at Stanford, he said, you better leave those white people alone. They don't play. He died being afraid of white people. When I watch my family and what they have gone through, I know we have made some progress, but I know it's not enough. In 1964, when I was going to go to college, I got a scholarship, a full scholarship, to go to Harvard. I turned to my family and I said, I'm not going. I have five sisters. My dad said, and my mom said, what? Boy, are you crazy? They didn't know about college, but they knew Harvard was somehow a place to go. <laughs> and I said, no, I'm not going. I said, why aren't you going to go? I said, they don't allow women in. And the response was, what's that got to do with you? <laughs> I have five sisters. And still, we didn't connect the dots. And And my parents, who are deeply loving, my father just passed at 99, deeply loving Christian family, they said, if you don't go to Harvard, don't expect any help from us. Now, I don't know what kind of help they were had in mind, because they couldn't help me with my homework. <laughs> and they didn't have any money. Uh, so I said, OK, fine. <laughs> but they did help. They continue to help. Uh, but my point in saying that is that at 16 years old, I knew something was wrong with saying half, more than half the population are not allowed in this institution. More than half. I knew there was something wrong with that. Uh, but I didn't get any support. The language wasn't right. Now I can talk about it a little bit more eloquently. Um, so my point is, who's missing? Who's at the table? and who's serving the table. 
How do you actually empower the groups that's most affected to really participate so that we all can belong? And I'll give you one example, and then I'm going to close. So I'm working with a group in Richmond, California, mainly blacks and Latinos. And Berkeley, which is touted as the number one public university in the world, was trying to develop some land in Richmond. And they said the community should be involved, the black and Latino community. Now here's this august university that has more Nobel laureates at Berkeley than at Harvard and Yale combined. And you know what Berkeley did? They spent millions of dollars bringing experts to come and do a study on developing this land. And they developed these big reports. And then the California Endowment, which is the largest foundation in California, turned to me and said, John, we'd like you to help the community be involved. And they literally would give us 300-page reports and say, you got a week to respond. And, the, and this was involvement. This was community involvement. And I turned back to the California Endowment and I said, we need to hire a developer. We need to hire a soil engineer. We need to hire um, a bond council. And they said, but John, we hired you. I said, I'm good, but I'm not that good. And I'm smart enough to know what I don't know. And you can't bring the community with the table to the table with no resources. So the endowment, they did fund it, reluctantly. So we thought we'd you know, hire you. But my point is, again, how do you make it so that we all can fully participate? And the most important exclusion is not exclusion in terms of money, it's not inclusion in terms of schools, it's exclusion in terms of setting the terms of the deal, it's inclusion in terms of defining, it's inclusion in terms of excluding in terms of deciding who decides. The first important thing is to say, you fully belong. What do you need to actualize your belongingness? And your belongingness, again, is not simply a thing about what do your community need? That's true. That's part of it. It has to be part of it. We're not trying to disappear these communities. But how do you belong and participate for your community and our communities? So we have a push in the world right now where some people are saying some people don't belong. And the liberal response to othering, which is what that's called, saying people are not fully human, people don't fully belong, they don't get the right to vote, they don't get a voice, they don't deserve resources. The response from the liberal community for, belong, for othering is called saming. Saming. You're just like me. And I know most of you are pretty cool out there, but I don't want to be you. <laughs> the, the issue of responding to othering is belonging, where you get to fully show up who you are. And James Baldwin said it best. When he was at the height of his literary career, he was invited to join some august writing club that he was really interested in being part of. And as he's going to join, they said, Mr. Baldwin, you can really write. You're an amazing Negro. And, you know, he made a documentary called I'm Not Your Average, I'm Not Your Negro. <laughs> they said, you're an amazing Negro. I'm not, I'm not your Negro. But anyway, <laughs> they said, you can write. So you can join. But here's the deal. Don't remind us that you're gay. And don't show up with your black friends. And Bowen left the country, went to France, and he wrote a book called The Price of the Ticket. And he said the price of belonging was too high. Uh, that the terms of belonging was too high. So one group should not set the terms. Um, so I'm encouraging, and I think Seattle plays a critical role in the country. You have resources. You have a lot of people of goodwill. You have problems, I know that. You have extreme inequality. Um, you have too many people sleeping in the streets. And I should, I should talk, being from the Bay Area. Uh,
but you have the resources to do this. But they have to be all of our resources. And I'll just end by saying, among all these committees about the future of work and what should we do with inequality and this tremendous wealth inequality. And I say to people, my position is all wealth, all wealth is commonwealth. Which means that we should decide, not someone at a big company that might live in Seattle by themselves. I mean, I'm just <laughs> hypothetically. <laughs> we should decide. That's what this radical idea of democracy is about. Uh, so again, it's been a delight to be here. Uh, I hope I have a chance to work with you more in the future. I work with, uh, and I've worked with you in the past. And, and I hope that as you struggle with issues, whether it's uh, how do you deal with the, the detention center or how do you deal with increased problems of inequality, that you do it with a kind of boldness, but a boldness that embrace both power and love and not dehumanize the person on the other side. Thank you.